Swings to the outside. Helmet goes flying, but he's in for the touchdown. I thought he had possession crossing the line, at least. That Look at that, that punishing hit on Thursday. That kind of play coupled with more stories of NFL veterans diagnosed with permanent brain disease has sparked so many questions about the future of football at a time when the NFL is more popular and profitable than ever. We have a panel of experts here to take on that debate. First, here's ABC's chief health and medical editor, Dr. Richard Besser, with a closer look at the science, the safety, and possible solutions. Steelers backing off playing wow. zone. What a hit. Football fans live for brutal blows. Look at James Harrison. And a very serious hit James Harrison lays out. Patrick Willis. Morgan Cox. Whoa. And that one was a knockout. Literally. And let's hope that Cribs is okay. But what thrills the fans may be what dooms the sport. Are we looking at the end of football? Memory loss, depression, dementia. Former players like Jim McMahon and Steve Young, along with new medical studies, are saying that what's good for football in its current form is lethal for the brain. Damaged Pros compares symptoms of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, degenerative brain disease, and the lasting effects of repeated blows to the head. On ESPN Radio, quarterback Brett Favre says he's losing his memory. This was a little shocking to me to, that I couldn't remember my daughter playing youth soccer. It was just one summer, I think. Former New York Giant Harry Carson says on PBS he contemplates suicide. I was so depressed that I just thought about accelerating and driving through the guardrail and, you know, just going over. And it turns out the future of football may rest on Dr. Ann McKee's scalpel. She's a walking contradiction a leading neuropathologist who studies CTE in the brains of dead players, and a diehard Packers fan, in love with a sport that can physically devastate players. She showed me the damaged brains of former athletes, donated for her research. And you get spot, spot, spot. That's really typical of this disease. Alzheimer's doesn't look like this. Never. Strokes. Never. Nothing. Nothing. I see tragic stories under the microscope. I see kids who've died in their teens with the early stages of this disease. It's really quite unsettling. A question I face as a pediatrician and when my own sons wanted to play football, is the danger of concussion so high that doctors and parents should forbid it? Can this sport be saved? I don't know. I just don't know. I went to a practice in the heart of football country, Athens, Georgia one of the many places football players barely come up to my knees. Oddly enough, we were coming in kind of late. Because Seven is late for starting football. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what I said. Really? <laughs> the midgets start at four. Four-year-olds yeah. playing football? A few weeks ago, the nation's largest youth football program, Pop Warner, announced that participation dropped about 10% between 2010 and 2012. Are parents scared for their kids' safety? I want to hear a strong argument in support of the game. And who better to give it than college coach of the Georgia Bulldogs, Mark Richt. Plain speaking, stoic, and a father of four. You have to wonder, is it a safe sport for, for my kids? I think we're quite frankly getting fairly soft in this country. I think our kids are soft. I don't think they're very tough. And uh, I think that's a little bit scary because there's some things in life that come up that are tough and you got to be able to handle them, whether it is a physical or a mental thing. <laughs> But his own team, along with several others, is doing concussion research right on the field. You'll see it on the screen. Mm -hmm. If I give it a hit. Give it a hit. Right there. That's it. Using cutting edge devices that may identify the forces that cause concussions so they can prevent them, that might help. Coach Richt supports the research. I think all these things that are being designed to help us understand more about concussions and those types of injuries, I think the better off we're going to be. But Ron Corson tells me the keys are education and independence. If he thinks a player needs to sit out, the player's out, regardless of what the coach thinks. We sit down with every athlete in every sport the first of the year and talk about what the signs and symptoms are of a concussion. So if they have them, they can recognize them and come seek help. Have you seen any change over time in, in players reporting a concussion or the signs of a concussion on their own? A great example uh, last year, in, in the fall Georgia football, we had nine concussions. Five of them self-reported. Then I talked to some of the players. If you had a concussion, would you pull yourself out of the game? Uh, if I had a concussion, uh, probably not. You can play through it. My first day of football, you said, I'm, you're going to guarantee three concussions, but we're going to pay for five years of your school, and you're going to get so many, like, how many ever degrees or whatever. Yeah. I'm saying absolutely. You take it. You're for three concussions? That's a, I'm taking yeah. it. That's not a bad deal at all.
And Dr. Besser joins us now along with Joe DeLamalure, an NFL Hall of Famer from the Buffalo Bills, Mark Fainer-Ruwada, investigative reporter from ESPN, co-author of League of Denial, and USA Today columnist, ABC News contributor Christine Brennan. Welcome to you all. And Joe, let me begin with you. You're wearing that Hall of Fame jacket. And I, and I saw your Hall of Fame speech. It was clear when you were given that speech, football was what you always wanted to do, always wanted to play. But now you've been diagnosed with CTE. And, and you say you're part of the forgotten generation of football players. Do you feel betrayed by the NFL? I be, feel betrayed by the NFL and the union because we have no health uh, insurance. That's a problem. For the guys who played before 93, we have sub-poverty pensions and no health insurance. That's a problem. And even though there has been this now multi-million dollar settlement, $765 billion settlement designed to help players who have been injured. They have a lot of programs, but they're hard to access. And the players, you know, let's face it, we're about all over 60. How many guys go on the internet? And how many guys, we're scattered all over the country with a union that has never helped us, the pre-93 guys. Once you're done, you're done with the union. They, they, they have all these sayings, but they really are hard you, to work You do through. make the point, talking about these pre-93 guys, you're talking a completely different world in terms of pay. When you were completely, playing. I was the number one pick. My salary was 22, 24, 26, 28, 30. Nothing guaranteed. 30,000 a year. Yeah. Here's the problem. We played on AstroTurf that was torn up. There's no head slaps. I got 68% hearing loss in my left ear. There's uh, no more chop blocks. There's no more wedge. It used to be called the Suicide Squad, the special teams. They, cha they even changed that to the special teams. And, and, Mark, you've done a lot of work, of course, looking at the league and, and, and how the league dealt with all of this, even this settlement, not going to go far enough for so many of the players. Well, I think there are real questions about it. I mean, we're talking about $765 million, and I think some of the reporting that, that Steve, my brother, and I have done on this issue is there are real questions about whether there's even enough money there. You've got a lot of players suffering as we've done the reporting on this, and, and a number of players wondering really whether in the end, um, where's, you know, is the money going to step up? Are there going to be players who decide that they, they want to opt out of the settlement because there's not enough? I mean, a lot of these guys feel very betrayed by, by the league's denial for two decades, and we, we sort of track the trajectory of that in the book and I think now as they as they try to get information about this settlement it's really hard to come by you've got lawyers and players who are really frustrated not getting any answers despite the announcement of a big settlement prior to the season starting and we're now in week 12 and there are virtually no details about the settlement at this point and Christine everyone waiting for evidence to show how much the league really knew or should have known for so long. Well, in the settlement, as we know, George, when they d agreed to that, that uh, the NFL then did not disclose what it knew and when it knew it. That would have been valuable information. But going forward, I was fascinated by the fact, Mark, of course, this great reporting on this. You have the situation where uh, it's over, right? That three quarters of a billion dollars paid out, even though there's been no money given to players yet. And there are many, as you said, wondering what's going on. But then the news comes out about Joe and about Tony Dorsett. And I Brett think Favre. Brett Favre, exactly. And I think what we're seeing here is the fact that this story is is not going away, and it will continue to be a part of our conversation as it should be. Yeah. I think. And, and, and there's only about ten million dollars in this for for research. It's pretty hard to deny <laughs> yeah. the basic facts, though. Here. Yeah, I. You know, w w concern I have is that in that settlement, there's no admission that there is a problem with football. And if there's no admission of that, and you're only putting $10 million into research, how are you going to know whether this sport could be made safe enough? That we would still want to watch it, but it would not do this. And, and what about below the NFL level? You know, as we were seeing in the, in the piece, these kids playing, playing in college ball are not going to own up that they've had a concussion. They're going to go out there and have it. And, and if that's happening time and time again, are they going to be experiencing the same thing that the pro and, players and, are? And, and Joe, you, you, your son played college ball yes, as well at Duke. At, at, at Duke. Are there any changes in the game that can you know, sort of solve the riddle that Rich was talking about there, make it something we still want to watch but make it safer? I think there's tremendous changes in the game. Just what I told you, no AstroTurf, no head slaps. There's a lot of rule changes for the better of the game. So I think they're doing the right thing. But for them to continue to do the right thing, they have to make it better for the guys who created this 
monstrosity of a, a league, and they, they just don't do it. So they're always getting negative. There's something good comes out, then the, uh, there's negative that comes out with it. Think NFL is ready to go farther? Well, I, I think the question, I mean, I think there's two issues. There's the league itself and the NFL and what NFL football is going to look like. And I'm I, frankly, Steve and I have said this, I, I don't think either of us want the sport to change. It's a brutal, violent sport. That's one of the appeals about it. gripped all weekend hey, watching right, the games. I mean, we, we were all talking <laughs> yeah. before the game about that, uh, that yeah. Auburn finish. I mean, so, uh, you know, the sport is what it is. This is, this is the, the sport. But but you did have for two decades. I mean, what did the NFL know when? I think we really trace that in the book, frankly. They know they've known for two decades this issue is there. And while the commissioner and the league are making moves forward on this issue in terms of rule changes that they're trying to mitigate, at the same time, when the commissioner is asked now, is there a link between football and brain damage? He says, Well, we're gonna let the doctors decide this. But the you doctors think the have been knowing this talk about to make sense. Sense wants to do right by the players. I do, yes. Roger Goodell is in his mid-50s. He has daughters who play lacrosse. And let's face the facts here that, yes, we're talking football, right. but if you say, okay, let's move my, my boy or my girl out of that sport, soccer, girls' soccer, the, the risk is, is huge. Any sport where girls and boys play at an at at equal level, George, so whether it's soccer, ice hockey, baseball, softball, girls are much more likely to have concussions than boys, and that risk is there. So you leave football, we say, okay, we're done with football. Well, then the risk exists in so many other sports. But I do think there is a question. What will football look like 20, 30 years from now? And the answer is, of course, we don't know. We don't know. I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. Thank you all very much.